presentation. Um, it's going to be super interesting. One of the interesting and cool things about being the chair of the Zoo Foundation is you get to learn lots of things about the education and conservation that's happening here at the Minnesota Zoo. And one of those things that I've learned so much about as part of my role is the Ulysses S. Seal Conservation Grant Program, which you're going to hear a lot about tonight. And it's something that a lot of the average people don't know anything about the work that the zoo is doing. And you guys as donors and insiders are going to get to hear about this cool work tonight. So I'm super excited. So thank you so very much for being here. We're happy to host you and to tell you more about the exciting work we're doing. Um, you're not here to listen to me talk. Uh, you're here to listen to all these amazing people we have that are going to be presenting tonight. And the first person I'd love to introduce to you is Dr. Seth Stapleton. Seth, you want to? Way to everybody. He's the director of field conservation here at the Minnesota Zoo, and we couldn't be happier or feel luckier to have him. Bear with me because he has such an amazing background that I don't want to screw it up, so I may be looking at my notes. Um, but as the director of field conservation here at the Minnesota Zoo, um, Seth is in charge of managing the uh, conservation programs both in Minnesota and the upper Midwest as well as the international piece. And as part of our conservation efforts in the upper Midwest in Minnesota, it's focused on the prairie butterflies, wood and blanding turtles, and what else am I forgetting? The mussels, of course. How could I forget the freshwater mussels? Part of the, um, the international piece, I think a lot of you are familiar with our work on the black rhino in Namibia as well as the Przewalski's horses from Asia, which we have some pictures up there on the board. And we also, uh, the fledgling um, chinchilla project in Chile. And in addition to those, those efforts, both in Minnesota and internationally, then we also have the Ulysses S. Seal Conservation uh, Program, which Seth also is in charge of. Now, prior to joining the Minnesota Zoo, Seth received his PhD from the University of Minnesota, and he studied polar bear ecology, I don't want to screw this up, polar bear population ecology, and he implemented non-invasive methods such as high-resolution satellite imagery and aerial surveys to monitor their populations in the Canadian Arctic. Now on the, you know, he kind of moonlights then as also a marine biologist. One of his loves is marine turtles, and so he spent the last 15 years studying them and managing that a long-term study of the critically endangered hawksbill in Antigua, West Indies. So he's a man of wears many masks. So he will uh, tell you more about all the programs tonight. But please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Seth Stapleton. Well, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction there. Um, as mentioned, my name is Seth Stapleton, and I manage the conservation programs here at the Minnesota Zoo. And when people hear, okay, he worked on, on polar bears, he does work on sea turtles on the side, how'd you end up in Minnesota? I always like to say it kind of splits the difference between the two. So. <laughs> okay, sea turtles. So I'm not gonna talk about sea turtles at all tonight, and I typically don't get an opportunity to talk about sea turtles when I'm presenting at the zoo or other locations, but um, I thought I'd take the opportunity to go ahead and slip in a picture of a sea turtle. So this is your... <laughs> Your gratuitous sea turtle image. Does anybody know what kind of sea turtle that is? It is not a hawksbill. Green. 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 Yeah, and we do have a green sea turtle here at the zoo. Okay. When people think of the Minnesota Zoo or think of zoos in general, this might be the type of image that comes to mind. The opportunity to get these up close and personal experiences with wildlife, often exotic wildlife, that you're really not going to get anywhere else. Um, we have great education programs that, that teach children and teach adults alike about uh, the animals and what we can do um, on our own to protect them in the wild. Okay? The Minnesota Zoo is first and foremost a conservation organization. And in fact, the mission of the Minnesota Zoo, as many of you are familiar with, is to connect people, animals, and the natural world to save wildlife. And I highlighted that save wildlife there uh, piece there because that's actually where my job and the job of our staff in the conservation department comes into play. We don't work with the animals that we have here on site at the zoo, in the zoo's collection. We have fantastic bio program staff that take care of the animals that we have at the zoo. My job really involves working with animals off site and ensuring that their populations are healthy and viable into the future. 
And the Minnesota Zoo has a rich history in conservation. It dates back to the inception of the Minnesota Zoo in the late 1970s. Uh, when you think about conservation at the Minnesota Zoo, you might think of animals like the trumpeter swan. Uh, the zoo played a key role in reintroduction efforts here in the state, bringing trumpeter swans back and building up those healthy populations. Perhaps the first animal you might think of with the zoo is tigers. It's on our logo, and many of my predecessors in the conservation department at the Minnesota Zoo have focused a lot of their efforts on the conservation of tigers. That includes work that's taken place right here at the zoo, as well as field efforts that have occurred off-site in places in the Far East. And of course today, the Minnesota Zoo Foundation and the zoo co-host the Tiger Conservation Campaign, which is a pretty impressive effort. It raises more than $200,000 annually in support of field conservation programs um, for tigers, in, primarily in the Far Eastern um, extent of Russia. So what does our current conservation landscape look like today? Well, I'm very proud of our programs. We have a huge diversity of programs, and I feel like our department is growing by leaps and bounds right now. We have a prairie butterfly program. Um, this is a Dakota skipper. We are in year four of our reintroduction efforts at a site uh, actually owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy near Lake Benton, Minnesota. So that's very exciting. We also have a program on the Powashi skipperling. This is a, a critically endangered species that is really teetering on the edge of extinction. At one point, it was the most common, uh, one of the most common butterflies in Minnesota. It was considered the most Minnesotan of all butterflies. It's now gone from Minnesota, gone from Iowa, gone from Wisconsin. So there are two populations remaining, one in Manitoba and one in Michigan. And our work is really focusing on bolstering those remaining populations with a head starting program. We have a freshwater turtle initiative. Our work includes partnerships with MnDOT to address and mitigate sources of road mortality. And then we also very closely partner with the DNR to look at how wood turtles are using the landscape and then how we can best mitigate potential threats from nest predation by animals like raccoons and skunks and badgers and so forth. And the, the Native Freshwater Mussel Program that was mentioned as well. Um, we work to head start mussels, so we receive tiny juveniles, just a couple millimeters in length, from the DNR and from the Fish and Wildlife Service. We grow them as quickly as we can with as high a survival as possible to return them to the wild so that we can really re accelerate those reintroduction efforts and, and make sure that these ecosystem engineers are healthy in the wild. Okay, So that's just what's going on in Minnesota for our department. We also have an international presence. Um, I'm sure many of you knew, know Dr. Jeff Montefiore. He coordinates our work in Namibia that's really focused on grassroots conservation. So. Uh, not a top-down sort of militaristic approach, but more working with the local communities, helping to um, increase the value that they attach to healthy wildlife populations. Um, super exciting stuff happening out there. We, contrary to what's happening across the rest of Africa, there have been no uh, rhinos that have been poached in our study areas since August of 2017. So that's, that's fantastic, and that's a really a huge accomplishment and a tribute to Jeff's work in Namibia. We have our Asian Wild Horse Program. Um, as mentioned, we have a long-standing relationship in Mongolia uh, with Hustai National Park and our partners at the Smithsonian. I had the privilege of going there this past October with uh, one of our veterinary staff to deploy GPS collars to track the movements across the landscape. And we're really excited about an upcoming reintroduction effort in Russia uh, near the Kazakhstan border this October, so stay tuned for more details about that. And then, of course, we're very opportunistic as well. We're looking for, for more opportunities to grow our conservation department with animals like this. This is our state bee of Minnesota, and it occurs right here on site. I've been in a workshop all week trying to figure out what the next steps are for the, the conservation of the federally uh, endangered rusty patch bumblebee. So it's a great opportunity for us to share messaging about what people can do in their own backyards to help the conservation of imperiled wildlife right here in Minnesota. And then we do have a fledgling chinchilla project. This is a short-tailed chinchilla. Um, it's a great program. The animal really helps us with our outreach uh, to communicate some of the threats that wildlife face in the nature. So we're looking forward to, to really advancing that program here uh, later this spring and summer. Okay? So there's a lot going on. There's a lot of capacity. There, there's a lot of resources that are being invested into our conservation programs here at the zoo. And when you look at the footprint of what we're doing, uh, of course, the Minnesota Zoo is a state agency, so we have a big star kind of focused on the upper Midwest. That's where our conservation work is really focused. But we do have an international presence as well, um, thanks to the, our rhino work, our Asian wild horse work, and our chinchilla work. Now, one of the programs people typically don't know a whole lot about is called the Ulysses S. Seal Conservation Grants Program. And that's what we're really here to talk about tonight. And before I get started talking about that grants program and turn over the floor to our other speakers, I wanted to talk a little bit about Dr. Ulysses S. Steele. And I thought I'd start off with a, a quote here that I found in a recent um, 
book uh, by one of his colleagues. And I thought this was a really powerful quote and kind of underscores uh, what he meant to the zoo conservation community and the zoo animal management community. Dr. Ulysses S. Steele arguably had a greater positive impact on the science and practice of zoo management, exotic animal husbandry, and species conservation than any other individual in the collective memory of those who practice these disciplines. That's a pretty powerful statement, and um, you know it's it's amazing that he was here. He was really here working at the Minnesota Zoo since the onset of the zoo in the 1970s, and he really built up the conservation legacy that we're we're growing from today. Okay, so what is his his legacy? Well, I've I've had the opportunity to do a bit of reading. I've had the opportunity to talk to some of uh, Dr. Seal's former colleagues uh, just to get a, to know a little bit more about him. I didn't have the privilege of working alongside him. Um, unfortunately, he passed away in the early 2000s, and I've been here since about 2016, but I did get the chance to talk to some of his colleagues. And some of the things they said were, well, he had a booming voice, a big physical presence, and a magnetic personality. He had a real capability of drawing other people to him. He was very innovative in his thoughts, and he had a, a lot of determination. I think the exact quote was, he had a hell of a lot of determination, and that's what allowed him to really execute a lot of these programs. Another thought that came through in my discussions with his colleagues was that he was working on potential solutions to problems before other people even realized there was a problem to, that needed to be dealt with. So he was very much ahead of his time and a forward thinker. And he had a very inclusive nature about him as well. It didn't matter what you did, if he felt that you could contribute to the problem, he would bring you along to help identify the solutions. Okay. So what were some of his more specific accomplishments not only here at the Minnesota Zoo, but in terms of his global conservation impact. One of the things that's really remarkable to me is sort of the breadth of his con contributions to the zoo conservation community. It ranges from everything from uh, wildlife mobilization, development of contraceptives, captive population management, to things like conservation planning and database archiving. So a whole slew of different activities that he really uh, was at the forefront of. He established a database of physiological norms for each species. So for example, if you're pulling blood work on gorillas or giraffes, what should those values actually be? And it was his idea to establish the physiological norms and he actually put it into practice. He created something that's today called Species 360. Um, this is a computerized inventory system and this is before many zoos even had computers. So we're, we're going back several decades at this point. Today, this system is used by more than 1,000 zoos there are records of more than 10 million animals representing more than 22,000 species in um, Species 360. And they're a partner NGO right here in the Twin Cities. Okay? He was also at the request of the IUCN, and that's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the original channel, uh, chair of what has today become the Conservation Planning Specialist Group. This is an integral organization for planning conservation efforts, making sure we're thinking about what we need to think about, weighing risks, considering benefits, and making an informed decision going forward. So he had a huge impact, not only here at the Minnesota Zoo, but also in terms of global conservation. And I did want to quickly acknowledge the fact that some of Dr. Seal's family is here, so thank you very much for, for attending tonight. So, the Ulysses S. Seal Conservation Grants Program was established in the early 2000s to honor the legacy of Dr. Seal. Um, the idea is that it allows us to extend our conservation footprint beyond Minnesota's borders and beyond our current projects that we're implementing internationally. Um, it also allows us to expand um, our work to a whole host of other wildlife species that we, we don't have the capacity to address with our current uh, field staff. One of, this is one of the coolest things about working at the Minnesota Zoo. I've had the privilege of working at a number of other agencies and conservation organizations. I can't say I've ever seen anything like this in terms of a staff engagement and conservation program. The program provides an opportunity for staff at the Minnesota Zoo and the Minnesota Zoo Foundation to champion conservation causes about which they're particularly passionate. That can either be in the form of participation, so our staff, our, our um, zoo keepers, our other staff, our foundation staff, can go out and participate, bring their skills to a particular conservation program, and then bring those conservation stories back here to the zoo. Or they can champion particular conservation organizations. If they don't have the, the time or the, the expertise necessary to go out and contribute to a particular conservation organization, um, they can direct funding to that conservation organization. So again, it's just a really unique program. And it's meant a lot to us in terms of our global conservation impact. 
So again, if we, we circle back here, these are our current field projects. So we're actively participating, leading, partnering in field programs. So we have an international presence. We're focused here in Minnesota. This graphic shows the Ulysses S. Seal conservation grants that have been awarded over the past three years. So there's quite a big difference there. It really increases our presence in Australasia, Africa, South America, the Caribbean, etc. So it expands our geographic footprint of what we're able to accomplish. The other way to think about this is what animals we're able to work with, okay? So over the past three years, this is not an exhaustive list of the species that we've been able to support for conservation work uh, via the, the Uli Seal Conservation Grants Program, but we have been able to, to champion projects associated with gray wolves, with tarpon, scarlet macaws, radiated tortoises, mountain yellow-legged frogs, blue-crowned laughing thrush, sand tiger sharks, arctic foxes, nautilus, Tasmanian devils, bears poacher, orange-bellied parrots, uh, West African slender snouted crocodiles, several sawfish species in Australia, blue eyed black lemurs in Madagascar, several seahorse species in Cambodia. And that says nothing of what you're going to hear about from our speakers here in just a few minutes. So it's really increased the breadth not only of our geographic footprint, but also the taxa that we're able to work on. If you want to attach some numbers to it, through 2019, there have been more than 250 grants made to more than 170 unique projects in 60 countries around the world, including the United States with grants to projects in 11 states plus Puerto Rico. In terms of participation by our staff, zoo staff have participated in grant funded programs in 30 countries, including the United States with participation in 12 projects right here in the US. In terms of dollars, to date, dating back to the early 2000s, more than $600,000 has been granted in support of conservation efforts through the Ulysses S. Seal Conservation Grants Program. So that's a significant conservation impact that the Minnesota Zoo and the Minnesota Zoo Foundation are able to make on a global scale. So that's all I have for you. I'm going to turn the floor over to our guest speakers now. Um, we're going to save questions till the end, um, but thank you again for being here. So my name is Eric Rees. I am the primary African penguin keeper here at the Minnesota Zoo. So you've probably seen me if you come to the zoo sitting on that rock in the middle of the penguin exhibit feeding the penguins twice a day. That's me. So about a year and a half ago, give or take, it was right around Christmas 2017 is when I got to go to South Africa. And I worked for an organization called SANCOB, and that stands for the Southern African Foundation for the Conservation of Coastal Birds. Wrong way. So first, I'm going to give you a little uh, refresher course on African penguins. Those are the penguins we have here. They're the only penguins that are endemic or found on the continent of Africa. Every once in a while, an emperor, or not an emperor, a king penguin or a rock hopper penguin will show up and all everybody in South Africa gets excited and they rush over to Boulder's Beach, wherever it is, and South African uh, parks has to keep everybody away. But if you see a penguin in Africa, it's probably this. Uh, they're about two feet tall, a little taller than that sometimes, maybe four pounds to some big ones get up to like 11, 12 pounds, especially when they're in pre-mold. They are highly endangered and that is why I went down there. They numbered about one million penguins at like 1900. Now there's 25,000 or so, they're dropping about 2% per year so they will be extinct if nothing happens by 2026. So, sand cob. It was started by this lady. Her name is uh, Thea Louise Berman Westfall, and she started by getting penguins and cleaning oil off them in her bathtub. Uh, she, when she started, she would treat as many as she could. She treated up to 2,500 penguins the first year, and they're doing that now every year. And it's pretty awesome. So, sand cob, they only treat seabirds. They treat mostly African penguins, Cape gannets, different types of cormorants, gulls. Uh, the seasons kind of change throughout the year. During our winter, their summer, that's their main chick season. That's when I went. They get upwards of 25,000 birds per year. 1,500 of those are going to be African penguins. 
Uh, during like their spring, our fall is when they get a lot of um, cormorants and gulls. And then when I was there, it was mostly penguins. And then two weeks after I left, the one down in the bottom uh, right there, it's called a broadbill prion. It's a really strange oceanic seabird. I was really upset I didn't get to see it, but yeah, I got there two weeks after I left. <laughs> really weird. It's got like a tube on its nose. So they started a chick bolsting program in 2011. And what that is, uh, they have rangers out in the colonies in South Africa. They kind of monitor all the penguins. They see penguins that aren't doing well, chicks that are clearly abandoned. They bring them into their facility, rehabilitate them. And then they, uh, the chick bolstering program, they actually were taking eggs in their, to their facility and raising them from hatch. And uh, it's been shown that without their efforts, the penguin population would be 19% lower than it is right now. And they've shown through studies that uh, these chicks raised by uh, their staff have the same survivability as the wild ones. So it's a huge help. So that is the normal garb at Sand Cob. Those are called rain slickers. They're really hot and kind of gross. And you wear, you cut, they cut the sleeves off of wetsuits to put on your arms for guards because penguins like to bite. And then you wear goggles. So this is like a typical day at Sand Cob, that disgusting looking brown slurry up there. That's the chick formula. They have a giant blender that you throw fish, krill, vitamins in, mix it all up. It smells awful. And you tube, you can see I'm tube feeding one of the penguin chicks there. You tube feed the, uh, the chicks. The penguins get tube fed, depending on what state they're in twice a day, and then they get fed fish for sure twice a day as well. That's the kitchen up there in the left of Sand Cob. So the rehabilitation process, they, birds are brought in usually by uh, volunteers or just people driving by and they see a seabird out. As I said, they only take in seabirds. When I was there, someone tried to bring in a sparrow and they were like, we can't take that, we only take seabirds, I'm sorry. And they sent them to a different rehab facility in South Africa. So they bring them in, they get a full medical workup. Um, that picture in the top right was a cool thing they had. They had this huge tub that was a nebulizer because a lot of the birds that come in have respiratory infections. So we would put two to sometimes four penguins in that nebulizer and uh, we were able to nebulize penguins. It was pretty cool. So yeah, they get a full medical workup. Typically when the chicks or really uh, sick penguins come in, they get brought into the indoor nursery, which is those two pictures at the bottom. Then they graduate to the outdoor nursery. Then they get moved to the outdoor pen three, which is where they get 20 minutes of swimming if they want to, because a lot of them have poor waterproofing because they've either been oiled or they were abandoned and they haven't uh, molted out their down. Once they graduate from that, they get moved to pen four, which is 20 minutes of forced swimming, and then an hour of forced swimming. And it was kind of, they would try to get out, but we're like, no, you guys gotta swim. This is how you're gonna get released. And once they mastered that hour of uh, um, forced swimming, their waterproofing's good, then it's time for the release. So the day of my release, we came in probably an early hour earlier than we normally would, take all the measurements, we check their um, radio transmitters in their back to make sure they're still working because uh, Sandcop does track their penguins after they're released. Cut off their uh, armbands. They all have their own identification bands. And then we release them. And my release was at Boulder's Beach, which is the same uh, beach that's our uh, penguin exhibit is modeled after. It looks just like uh, um, Boulder's Beach, our exhibit. So I have to say our exhibit guys did an awesome job because I was I walked out there and I'm like, wow, it looks just like our exhibit. <laughs> um, so we released seven penguins when I went out there. It was about an hour's drive, and the one on the far right there, the one penguin, he was just in shock. He just stood there for probably ten minutes just staring at the ocean and the thousands of other penguins. And then he finally ran to the other uh, colony there. So if you want to help penguins, there's a couple of ways you can. main thing we tell everybody is sustainable seafood. Uh, we have a kiosk over in Discovery Bay. We tell guests that all the time, go check that out. But a really easy way is download on your smartphone Seafood Watch from Monterey Bay Aquarium. You can just pull that up when you're at a restaurant or a grocery store. It'll tell you what to pick. 
You can donate to places like the Minnesota Zoo or to Sandcop. And then if you have any college-age students that have a little wanderlust, everybody at Sandcop is a volunteer. They love volunteers. You need no penguin experience. Most of the people I work with had never been around a penguin. So I was teaching them how to handle penguins. So yeah, a lot of the people, there was people all from all over the world, Europe, Australia, America, down there volunteering with penguins. So if you want to go help Sandcom, they would love it. So thank you. I just want to thank the Minnesota Zoo Foundation for allowing me to go to South Africa and work with Sandcom. The bird crew for picking up the slack for the three weeks I was gone, and then also my wife for letting me go to South Africa for two weeks right around Christmas. <laughs>
<laughs> named after Stevie Nicks. We once again recorded all the stuff that we needed to. We took her measurements, took pictures of her, and we released her right back to there. That snake bite right there on my hand didn't even feel it. The teeth are so sharp that you can't even feel the teeth going in. And I looked down and, wow, it's clinging onto my hand. <laughs> Our last bull snake was Aria. Aria was actually underground. She was actually in this berm right here. And we tracked her with the radio telemetry to a hole and we tracked her under the ground, we couldn't find her, we knew she was alive, we knew she was moving, we could actually see her feet moving on the antenna, but we couldn't get to her, so um, we let her go and we drove back uh, and looked at some of the prairies. The prairies that we're looking at are some of the most pretty places I have seen. I thought I loved forests, I thought I loved lakesides, but looking at all the colors, looking at all of the plants, looking at all the other things out in these prairies, I can see why some people like these. They're pretty cool. Um, now, the DNRs uh, are having a hard time finding these bull snakes, and um, a while back, the um, state decided to replant some of these, and the DNRs people thought that they might have used the wrong seed mixture because now all they can find are little fox snakes, snakes that are smaller than these guys, but that's all they can find. They think it might be a little bit too dense to, for these guys to go. Now, after that, we actually um, went and checked on Aria again, and then we went back to our hotel. Now, if you look at some of our other presentations, they might have some of the things that they're eating. They might be eating bugs off of leaves, they might be eating um, some exotic fruits or other stuff like that. I went and had nachos. <laughs> got to sleep in a hotel room at night, got nachos, a nice hot shower. All in all, pretty fun time for Donnie. <laughs> I also got a picture with that guy. <laughs> Checked an aria one more time. And she still wasn't out. She was still moving around under the ground. She'd moved like 20 feet to the right, but she still hadn't come out. So we went back to our hotel room, and day two, we checked on Aria, still underground. We couldn't get to her. Now, she was something that we had to actually find that they were really excited to try to find because she was a younger snake, and the battery on her telemetry unit was going to run out over the winter time. So if they didn't find her this winter time or this uh, summertime, they weren't going to be able to find her again. They were going to have to catch her again as a wild snake without a radio collar. So they wanted to find her, so we went out and checked for her again. She wasn't there, so we went to a secondary site where we were looking at hognose snakes. Now hognose snakes are little snakes, not this one. They are a little bit smaller, about, uh, about a foot long, and they're little guys that got a little pig nose. There you go. I tell all the volunteers, whoever get to work with them, that they get bonus points if they make little pig noses. <laughs> But one of the things that we are looking for is we're looking at hibernaculums. We're looking at places where, um, I think the snake just hit the button. There you go. Now, we're, oh, not that picture either. There you go. Now, um, we're looking for the hibernaculum. We're actually looking for these places where these animals sleep. They're trying to figure out when these animals go into their dens, when they come out of their dens, and things like that. So we went to the prairie, we went to a different prairie to where bull snakes and um, hognose snakes will sleep. We didn't find any hognose snakes, but we did find some snake sheds. We found some prairie skinks, which I tried to catch but couldn't. Found some really cool rocks. <laughs> Very pretty flowers. And we actually did find the hibernaculum. We're standing right next to it. It's right by that little rock right there. And all it is is a little hole that um, the DNR specialists have um, tracked snakes to in the past. Now, what our funding actually went to was this. Now you can see that heavy gauge fencing was there to keep the cattle, this is a cattle pasture, or it's uh, open land, it's a, a multi-use land that um, the state runs and farmers can move it out there, but they are worried about the cattle stomping through this and they're damaging where these snakes sleep. Maybe as they're sleeping or as they come back in the fall when it's starting to get cold out, they don't have a place to sleep. So they set up this big fence right there. They also set up time-lapse cameras to figure out who's going in, when they go in, when they come out, and other things like that. Now, on our way home, we actually talked about something else. We talked about snake fungal disease. This is actually a snake that was found in eastern Minnesota. It's a disease that's coming um, from the east part and it's affecting snakes. It makes their, um, their scales almost crust over so they can't see, they can't move, they can't do many things like that. And part of our funding from the grant actually went to study this snake right here. Now what this presentation needs is another picture of me. <laughs> Looks pretty good up there. Now, um, 
I want to say thank you. I had a lot of fun. People think that you have to go to South America or Africa or other places like that to see amazing animals. My trip to Western Minnesota, I got to see ducks. I got to see eagles. I got to see bull snakes out in the wild, which is one of the species that I work with every single day in the zoo mobile. But I actually got to see what they actually are out in the wild. The animal that I'm holding right now is a lot different than the one that we get to see out in the wild just because you get to see it using its natural habitat. You get to see it using its adaptations. You get to see how well these colors, when I say this animal really camouflages in, it's really tough to see until you actually almost step on one. So thank you to the ULSC's SCL grant program for letting me go out there. Thank you to my coworkers. Thank you for everyone. And thank you guys. Right now, we are going to have our intermission right now. I will be down here with the snake if you guys want to come down and see him, if you guys want to take pictures with him or anything else like that. So thank you. Sorry, Don. <laughs> I can die with sharks and hug sea turtles, so. <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk about corals and coral reef conservation. Um, Ulysses SCL Conservation Grant, I got to use it um, to go down to the Caribbean to do some coral work, which is really cool. I'm going to talk about that. But first, an overview on corals. When I teach, sometimes I teach classes here at the zoo and elementary school, high school, and I ask, is a coral a plant, an animal, or a rock? Does anyone know? I think we all know, right? Yeah, they're animals. Uh, they're invertebrates. Oh, I can look down here. They're invertebrates. Same family as jellies and sea anemones. That means they have stinging cells. They're radially symmetrical. If you cut them in half, you're always going to have identical halves. But if you were to guess they were a plant, you would not be far off because corals actually house algae cells, which is a plant, right? They have a symbiotic relationship. So when they grow, they ingest algae, and the algae photosynthesizes light, gives the energy to the coral, and then the coral houses or gives a safe haven to the algae. Um, that is why corals are so colorful, and why you find them in shallow water is in very clear water, because they're photosynthesizing light. Now, if you mentioned or you guessed it was a rock, you're also not far off, because lots of corals, not all, but many of them actually take calcium out of seawater and build limestone, and that's their skeleton, and they build these big reefs. The picture this laser pointer left? Yeah, so that picture on the bottom left there is the coral exhibit here at the zoo, and those are mostly stony corals building the reef. So corals come in all shapes and sizes. If you look at a coral colony up there, that is a staghorn coral, and if you look closely, these are all little polyps. Each one's about the size of a rice grain. That's an animal, and they are all connected inside. So if one eats, if one polyp eats, they all get the nutrition. Um, and they all come in all different sizes. You get the uh, button coral, this is from our exhibit, that's about the size of a softball, that is one polyp, so a single polyp coral. And then you get the, big, the biggest coral in the world, this is Big Mama, she's 5,000 years old. And I forget the actual dimensions, but um, she's off American Samoa, and considered the largest coral in, in the world. Uh, coral reefs, right? So they build these reefs, and what are they? They're extremely important, they're kind of known as the rainforests of the sea. They house 25% of all living animal, or the marine animals live along coral reefs. And that's a pretty cool number because you only find corals in 2% of the oceans. So they're extremely important. They provide shelter for thousands of marine species. They're extremely important coast, uh, to protect coastal communities. A lot of people might not think about that. Corals are shallow. A lot of times they come out of the water and they absorb the energy from waves protecting the coastline. And as coral reefs are disappearing, Hurricanes are getting stronger. There's a lot of island nations that are losing their shoreline. Uh, and then, of course, multi-billion dollar industry with fishing, commercial, recreational, and scuba diving. So what are the threats? Unfortunately, there's quite a lot. Physical threats are anchors, bad divers, right? Uh, pollution, a lot of places, their agricultural and sewage runoff goes right into the coral reefs. Uh, overfishing, uh, Southeast Asia has a pretty big um, dynamite and cyanide fishing problem that kills corals. Ocean acidification, as the CO2 is going up in the atmosphere, pH drops in the water. Once the pH decreases, they can't make limestone anymore. So that's a problem. Disease is a major problem, I'll talk about that in a second. And then you've probably heard about bleaching. Bleaching is when the temperature changes in the water and the first thing corals do for some reason no one knows is they spit out that algae that I just told you about. 
they release it and they turn white, they bleach. Now a bleached coral is not dead, it's dying. It's got three to four weeks to get back to the right condition and it will reabsorb the algae, which is awesome for me because they'll bleach in my exhibit, <laughs> but I can fix the problem and then it'll come back. The ocean, not so lucky, right? They cannot change their temperatures in a couple of weeks. So generally, if a coral is bleached in the ocean, it's pretty much gone. Um, state of the reefs, there's a lot of dismal numbers out there. Uh, Great Barrier Reef has a number of bleaching events happening. There are NOAA, which is the basically the U.S. Oceanic Administration, says by 2040, 90% of all corals will be dying. Um, some say 2050, all corals will be dead. So it's a very, very drastic thing that's happening. This is uh, pretty new. This is a disease that's happening in Florida. It started in the Miami Harbor. Two years ago, it's a bacteria that's spreading and it just reached Jamaica. I just heard today it is a 100% mortality rate. So when it touches a coral, it's dead. And Florida, is ha the keys are done. I hate to say it, I think 95% of corals are dead in the keys right now. Um, and the Fish and Wildlife and um, NOAA, they're asking zoos and aquariums to actually take corals in now from the Florida area to, as an arc, essentially kind of like the seed vault in uh, Norway so that we can keep these corals and hopefully plant them back again someday. Uh, so that was all really terrible news. <laughs> I'm going to flip it around. we got some good stuff going on. There's an organization called C-Corps that I'm very fond of. C-Corps started uh, about 10 years ago. It is a group of scientists and aquarium professionals that get together and help conserve and rebuild coral reefs. It started at the Columbus Zoo and the Rotterdam Zoo. And their, their motherships in Curacao and the Caribbean, they now exist in the Virgin Islands, Mexico, you can read it up there, and then Australia actually is just added as well. And Secor has these workshops that are really cool. They happen during the annual coral spawning event that I'll talk about in a second. It's an opportunity for aquarists and coral scientists to get together, brainstorm, and most importantly, head out on the reef, collect coral gametes, so sperm and eggs, fertilize them in a lab, and then plant them back on the reef. And that is really important because um, corals reproduce two different ways. Asexually, which is where they just break off. They literally just fall off onto the reef. Not very effective because it's a clone, right? And it doesn't go anywhere. It just stays there. Or sexual reproduction where they actually release sperm and eggs into the water. And then they drift into the current and then they can settle onto the reef. So this big spawning event happens at the first full moon in August, September, and October, depending on the coral and depending on the day after the full moon and the hour. So some species will be 8 o'clock the second day after a full moon. It's all been charted out. So 2017, I learned about Secor. I applied the wonderful grant that we have here, and I was sent to Curacao for a workshop. My colleague Josh, who works here, also takes care of corals, went in 2018. And then just last fall, I went to the Bahamas for their new workshop, which I'm going to talk about for the rest of this presentation. So, a very one minute overview on how corals uh, reproduce sexually, right? There are male coral colonies, there are female coral colonies, and there are hermaphroditic, so you get both. Let's say one species, the day after the full moon, at 8 o'clock at night, the males will start releasing their sperm into the water. Half an hour later, the females release their eggs. They all float to the surface, and they fertilize each other. The hermaphroditic corals, which is brain coral here, they release egg sperm bundles, that go up to the surface and break open, and then they fertilize um, in the current. So, oops. Oh, some of my pictures aren't coming out. Oh, out of order. So these are eggs, coral eggs. This is what they look like when they're fertilized. See, they start uh, dividing. And then after about three days, they turn into a planula, which is a coral embryo. Here we go. And that's a free swimming organism. So it spends a couple of days just swimming around in the ocean and it looks for the reef and it sinks down to the reef and it finds a spot to live for the rest of its life. Pretty cool. And we very, very rudimentarily, if that's a word, did that at the zoo here as well. So we have some little polyps that found their home. This next thing I hope plays is a video of a coral planula looking for its home on the reef. Kind of falls down, crawls along the reef and then finds a spot and boom, that's where it's gonna be for the rest of its life. How do they know where to land, where to go? That's a huge question, major research being done on that. The short answer is that there's a specific type of algae that they look for, that the calls to them. All right, so I headed down to the Bahamas. Uh, 
at the very end of September, and a week before I left, you guys remember Hurricane Dorian? Yeah. Uh, absolutely destroyed Abaco up here, leveled it. Um, so I thought the trip wasn't going to happen, but apparently Eleuthera got a little bit of rain. That's how they described it. So, okay, got on the plane and went to Eleuthera, absolutely gorgeous. I don't know if you've ever been there. And right at the tip there is a marine biology lab called the Cape Eleuthera Institute. Awesome. Um, they also have a one, sem one semester program for college students. If you have any, if you are in college or have any kids, it's amazing. It's like a boot camp for marine biology. It's pretty neat. But they also have a whole mar marine biology center that um, C-Corps uses for this workshop. So I headed down there a couple days before the full moon in September. And the first few days were um, lectures by the kind of the scientists, and then we dove the site. The site was a mo uh, an hour and a half away by boat. Their research boat broke down the day I got there. Sweet. So we used their little small boat. And what I thought was pretty cool was that the year before, when the corals spawned, they tagged them, and we put little buoys on them so that we wanted to see if the same coral would spawn the next year. So that was kind of neat. So I had to dive this a bunch of times to get used to it because you're doing it late at night and there's a lot going on. So we had to get our bearings straight, and I was put on team two, going after the mountainous star coral, which you see here. This is a very big reef building coral. It grows very fast, and we had to do a lot of lab work kind of get it ready. And then Margaret Miller, she's the head scientist for SeaCore, showed us how to capture the spawn, right? So what you do is this is a kind of a cone-shaped net with a lead bottom, and you just put it over a coral that's spawning, and then the little cup there will collect the eggs as they're going up. So um, here comes the full moon, right? We got on the boat, nice hour and a half boat ride, choppy seas, not for the seasick. And we had a lot of gear. This is all attached to us while we were diving. And you wait. We waited and waited. We did two 90-minute dives every night for seven nights. Actually, one night we got uh, stormed out, but uh, they spawned. Every night we got the corals that we were looking for, so it was a huge success. This is what it looks like when egg bundles go into a collecting cup. Uh, these are all little shrimp, and if one shrimp gets in there, they eat all the eggs and it's ruined, so you have to make sure no shrimp got into the cup. And speaking of shrimp, I got, I got asked a lot, like, are you scared of sharks while you're diving at night and all And actually, no, I chase the sharks. I love the sharks, right? <laughs> what I'm scared about are these things, millions of worms that uh, follow your light. Yeah, I can still feel them around my mouth. <laughs> uh, yeah, they are everywhere. So they made life quite difficult. Uh, you get used to them, shake about in the shower. Um, anyway, it was a big success. We got... Uh, uh, 1.2 million eggs, I think, total. And what we do is we, we take those cups up onto the boat. I think it's the next picture. Yeah. Okay, put them on the boat, put them in this big cooler. And the cooler, because the waves were rocking, right, he's kind of mixing everything around. Uh, hour and a half boat ride back to the lab. We put them in these gravy boats. These are like gravy separators here. This is all the sperm, these are the eggs. And we spent hours and hours and hours cleaning out the sperm so you get clear water. You look in the microscope and the eggs just start dividing right away, like right when they get fertilized. Um, so it was a big success. We got, like I said, I think a million or so at the end of it, um, fertilized eggs and planula, coral embryos. So what did we do with all of those, right? Well, there were a lot of different experiments being set up. Uh, National Science Foundation was there, Shedd Aquarium, uh, Frost Science Museum. They had all these different experiments. I was teamed up with the Frost Science Museum where we took little pieces of the reef with all the algae I was telling you about that the planula look for, and we put the embryos in these, and we found out where they like to settle, which corals, which algae they like the most. Some people are experimenting with sound. A coral reef is very loud, and the planula would swim to the sound. All different things happening, and then the next day we look with the microscope, and you can see them kind of settle into the, the work. Now, the majority of the coral, of course, were put on these this pool that we built before. Um, these are all 3D printed tetrapods with high surface area, and the, they're put out in the ocean for about two weeks. It grows that good algae on it, and all those embryos will settle on these tetrapods. And what, this is what it looks like after they've settled. So there's a little coral in here, right? And what's so before these tetrapods, which Seacor invented, you would go around and glue pieces of rock onto the reef, and it took forever, right? Now you just dive around with these tetrapods and shove them into the reef, literally just like all over. 
and they're upscaling, so they're getting to the point where they want to just be able to take a boat and just dump them on the reef, right? In Australia, they have a drone already that's going around looking for a spot and just releasing them. So it's all about getting as many as you can with as little time and cost. Uh, and it's been extremely successful. This next picture, it's kind of old at this point, but this is a palmata. This is the most critically endangered coral in the Caribbean, 97% gone right now. Uh, this was made in the lab a year later, that's what it looked like. This is four years later. And I show it to you because this is the first ever known coral grown in a lab that then spawned itself on the, on the reef. So they now have had multiple generations from this one. This is quite a while ago, and this is what kind of uh, Mexico looks like now. These are all spawned in the lab. And this white is good. This is not bleached. This is actually growth ring. So if you see white on the edge of a coral, that's it laying its skeleton down. And I want you to also just look at the fish, right? These fish would not be here without the coral. And a neat little experiment that we did is, actually it was in Curacao, but we took a pic an area of sand where there was nothing, took a picture, put a rock on it with a piece of fake coral, went back the next day, I think we had 15 fish on it, and a couple of crab, you know, just by putting that there overnight. So it's really incredible how important corals are for the whole kind of marine community. Um, so that was my experience in the Bahamas. It was really long, you know, long days, long nights. Uh, it was hard work, but it was worth it. My last picture here, because on the last day we got to hang out in these old tight, these pools, look at that. Yeah, with the waves crashing, so it was definitely, it was awesome. Um, so I want to thank, of course, the Ulysses S. Hill Conservation Grant, Minnesota Zoo, Aquarium for covering myself on gone, Sea Corps, I sniped some pictures for some people, and um, I just want to stress how incredible that grant is, and I really hope that we can keep doing it for the Sea Corps, and also the Minnesota Zoo is a organizational sponsor of Sea Corps, so we don't just go there, we also like give them a grant every year as well the past two years, so I want to thank them for that. Thank you. I hear Christoph talk about corals, I'm like, oh my god, corals are so amazing. <laughs> um, but I'm talking about a really cute animal. <laughs> corals. But my name is Mary, and I am part of our behavioral husbandry team here at the Minnesota Zoo, which basically is a little umbrella of our marine mammal department, our close encounters department, and then our behavior management department. And I work in all three of those, and it's the best job at the zoo. <laughs> um, but I had the amazing opportunity to travel up to Alaska and work with the Alaska Sea Life Center's Rescue and Rehab Department. Um, it's located in Seward. Learn this from Christoph too. Learn the, uh, it's located in Seward, um, which is about a two and a half mile or a two and a half hour drive um, south of Anchorage, and it's a gorgeous drive. You kind of pass around um, the Turnigan Arm, which is just a beautiful drive down there. And uh, Alaska Sea Life Center was opened in 1998, and it's one of the only um, facilities in, it's the only facility in Alaska that kind of combines uh, public aquariums, so education, um, rescue and rehab, and then also research as well. Um, so the facility itself isn't that big, but it is set up beautifully. It um, really has amazing education happening throughout um, the facility itself. They do a lot of different behind the scenes tours. They do a lot of different types of encounters where people can come up and learn a little bit more either about individual animals um, or the individual species. And then they also do like an encounter where you can go meet some researchers or you can um, meet the rescue rehab team or some of the rescue rehab animals. So they do a really great job with their education. And then um, one part that it was kind of slow when I was there, which is really awesome for me because I kind of got to see and meet a lot more people than I probably otherwise would have. So I got to hang out with some of their research um, folks and it's kind of, I was listening to Seth and him talk about the conservation work we do. Um, they have a full hallway of just researchers, and it changes all the time, so there's a lot of different projects um, going on at any given time. And I was able to kind of shadow some of those researchers 
and um, learn a little bit more about the conservation work that they're doing. Um, so I could talk about that all day, but I just chose a couple that I wanted to highlight. Um, the ice seal uh, metabolic research. This one kind of hit home for me because I train animals, and this is a, a collaboration effort between Santa Cruz or um, Long, Long Marine Lab and then also Alaska Sea Life Center, where they're basically working with the animals that we have under human care, and we're learning some basic um, baseline data from them. So things that we probably wouldn't be able to do out in the field, um, we're learning from our animals. And this may not sound impressive to you guys, but they train these seals to sit still underneath a big scary dome for five to 20 minutes collecting that data, which I don't know, I'm sure a lot of you are parents. Um, it's like asking a child to sit still for 20 minutes and do pretty much absolutely nothing. And then they look at um, what that what kind of energy they're expending at different temperatures, um, whether they're molting or not, and things like that. And then they're going to use, hopefully be able to use that to advocate for seal conservation. Um, and the three species they're looking at are bearded seals, spotted seals, and ring seals. And then the stellar eider research was really neat too. Um, eiders are a large seabird or large sea duck, and they are <coughs> completely extinct from one of their native um, breeding grounds in Alaska and they're quickly declining in another. So they're very endangered and what they're working on right now is figuring out how we can keep them in captivity, uh, potentially breeding them in captivity, looking at what parameters they can handle and then kind of making that decision of whether or not these animals can be re-released and if that is, has potential to be successful. Um, and that was really cool. And the picture, go back to it. Mm -hmm. The picture there at the bottom, um, that part kind of in the back there, that was all, they have, it was really neat because they had different little areas where like this has this much salinity in the water, like how are we doing with this? And so on and so forth. And then um, they're doing a ton of stellar sea lion research, but the one I'm going to focus on, um, basically they go, the Chiswell Bay is a big breeding area for sea lion or stellars, and stellars are really hard to study because they spend most of their life out at sea. So what they're doing is they are collecting juvenile um, sea lions and then they are giving them a health exam, so they're kind of figuring out like how healthy is this individual, and then they'll attach internal and external loggers, and they're kind of looking at where are these animals going, um, how are they doing, um, how deep do they dive, all that kind of information that we really don't know, and they are putting their um, resident sea lions to work because they're looking um, or using them to kind of figure out what types of telemetry works, what, what types of external loggers are going to help um, mitigate their behavior or changes in their behavior and things like that. So that was cool to see them ask their animals to come on up. They attach a little um, logger or a little telemetry device and then see how long it takes for them to pop it off. <laughs> and then what I really went down there to do was get involved. I work with sea otters and I was going to get involved with um, rehabilitating sea otters. And it really depends on the year. Some years they have tons of sea otters, some years they have none. Um, and you know, you're hoping for, I was like, I'm hoping for a sea otter, but really I'm not. It could be great if they didn't need rescue and rehabilitation, they just were healthy. Um, but there was one when I was there. When, um, I feel like I'm skipping something here. Um, so there was one sea otter when I was there, but I wanted to focus on how the Alaska Sea Life Center is the only permanent um, rescue rehabilitation center for marine mammals. So there are lots of different types of animals, um, fish, birds, but the only one that is recognized or able to really support um, marine mammals is the Alaska Sea Life Center, which is located down there in Seward, and Alaska has more coastline than the rest of the United States put together. So it's a lot, they, get, they can see a lot of animals go through their doors. Um, and they receive calls for animals that are dead and alive, so they want to really just learn more about um, how the wildlife is doing in Alaska, and this is one, one way that they can do that. 
Um, so yeah, sea otters. I'll do a little brief history of sea otters. They're really, really cute. They are very, very furry. They are the um, they have the densest coat of any animal in the world. They have about a million hairs per square inch, and they need that coat because they live in really cold waters and they don't have that blubber layer. But because they have that great coat, they were hunted to near extinction um, during the the hunting um, trade or during the fur trade, and their numbers could have dropped over a million and down to one one thousand to two thousand animals at the height of the fur trade. Um, but there were protections placed, and their numbers have definitely rebounded. It's a pretty great success story, but there are certain locations where they're still endangered. Um, and sea otters are really important. They are keystone species, so much like the corals, um, sea otters are helping kelp forests, and kelp forests, they help those coastal areas um, kind of help the erosion there. Um, they're home to a lot of different types of animals. They cook, sequester a lot of CO2, um, so they're really important. And sea otters eat benthic herbivores, so um, urchins and things like that, that can wipe out kelp forests pretty quickly if left unchecked. So they're pretty important, um, but they're also kind of sensitive. They need, like I talked about a lot about their coats, um, they need those coats to survive, and so they're very susceptible to especially oil spills, um, because they, they need those coats to keep themselves warm, so they're susceptible to hypothermia, and then they're constantly grooming to keep those coats nice and clean and doing their jobs, so um, they, if they ingest oil, that's obviously not great. And then, um, sea otter moms are really the unsung heroes out there. Um, sea otters, they have those coats, but they also have a super high metabolism to help keep themselves warm in those cold waters. Um, so they eat a lot. They eat about a quarter to a third of their body weight every single day. And um, moms do nearly twice that much. So they spend a lot of time between 30 and 50% of their day hunting a normal sea otter, so a mom spends um, almost twice that amount. So they don't have a lot of time for much else while they're awake besides hunting. Um, and sea otter pups stay with their mom for a while. They're there for about six to eight months. Um, and during this time, they are pretty much dependent on mom. Um, so this is kind of one of the reasons why you'll see uh, pups that were left a little bit too early, that they weren't quite weaned, and that's kind of where uh, the Sea Life Center comes in. Um, so when I was there, like I said, there was just one otter, and he was already about three months old. The first three months are really the hard time. Um, sea otters need 24-7 care. They eat every three hours, and between the time that they're, they're first eating and the next feeding, you need to be grooming them, teaching them how to groom themselves, teaching them how to swim. I don't believe they did any forced swimming, but maybe there was some forced swimming involved with that. But I kind of missed a lot of um, the really nitty gritty hard stuff. Um, but when I got there, it was great for me because what they needed me for was kind of the training. So this individual, his name ended up being Odiac, but we called him Cordova while I was there because that's kind of where he was found or he was picked up. Um, he was going to be, or he was sent to Portugal and he was going to hang out in the zoo. And so they wanted to get some, basically some base behaviors going on with him. And they also needed him to get used to going in a crate. He needed to go, um, I probably smell really bad, <laughs> in a crate. And so, I worked really hard to get this animal comfortable going in the crate, spending long durations in the crate, and then transition him. He was going to be going um, to a facility that was outdoors. So when I got there, he was spending 24-7 uh, inside, and my job, basically they trained me, like, here he is, here's how we feed him, this is what we're doing, see you later. And um, my job was to get him comfortable being outside. So we started, like I said, with the crate and then transitioning him outside um, after the crate. And then he was a stinker, like all otters are. And so um, in his inside area, to get in, you had to climb over the wall. Um, in the outside area, you walk through a gate. So he would be right at the gate, kind of waiting there. Um, and they didn't have a secondary containment area. So with our otters here at the zoo, 
when we come to the door, they know we go to the water, and then they come in and we get lots of fun stuff, some toys, some treats, uh, lots of snacks. So we taught him to do that as well, which was pretty neat to be able to bring some of the things we do here at the zoo um, there. And then I learned a ton of cool stuff from there with uh, enrichment and things like that too. So I spent a lot of time with this little guy um, hanging out and teaching him and he taught me and um, the last 72 hours that I was up in Alaska was a little bit different. They got an emergency call and everything was kind of hush hush and we didn't really know what was happening. Um, but then they brought this little guy in. Um, this is Aku and he is Indian in Indianapolis right now so if you want to go see him you can. Um, but he was found um, on a barge. Gold miners found him. And if you know anything about walruses, I didn't as I learned a ton about wal walruses. So they're super gregarious um, and moms are very, very protective. So to see a calf alone is odd. So they waited a while because walruses, like sea otters, are an animal that are very hard to reintroduce or impossible in this case to reintroduce um, back into the, the wild. So once they brought him in, he was going to be in human care and that's never the goal. Um, so they waited a while, but it was very clear that mom Something happened to mom where she couldn't care for him. So they flew him down from Nome, way up there. Um, he came to Alaska Sea Life Center. And moms, unlike sea otters, sea otters will wrap their pups up. They'll go find food. They come back up in the kelp and unwrap them, feed them. Um, moms don't, don't leave their side. So they come, they're like hanging out, rubbing on their calves. Um, so my job is literally walrus cuddling. So the last <laughs> hours of my time there, I just hung out with this little guy. Uh, and it was an amazing experience. Like, I can't wait to apply to go again <laughs> somewhere. Um, so yeah, thank you. I want to thank all the people that all my colleagues thanked. And then thanks to all of you guys, because really we can't do what we do with all, without all of you. So thanks so much. So that was a great series of talks really highlighting the diversity of programs in which your staff have participated with the support of the Ulysses S. Seal Conservation Grants Program. Now there are ways for the general public, of course, to, to participate in conservation efforts as well. And the, the most uh, growing field for, for public participation in conservation and science in general is citizen science. And I like to think of citizen science as the power of the people. And citizen science is really all about harnessing the power of the people to overcome some of those hurdles that you might have in a typical research setting. Things like, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough uh, staff capacity to be able to go out and do what we want to do across the entire spatial scale, across the entire landscape. So citizen science provides that capacity um, in terms of the general public. Citizen science dates back uh, more than 100 years, actually. Uh, this is probably the most well-known example of citizen science. Um, and I'm sure it's very clear what I'm talking about by this picture here. Uh, Christmas bird count. Has anybody heard of the Christmas bird count before? Has anybody participated in the Christmas bird count before? Okay. This past year was the 120th year of the Christmas bird count, which is pretty darn impressive, I think. This is a, a citizen science program that's been administered by the National Audubon Society since the turn of the 20th century. Um, it involves over a three or four week period, uh, groups of the general public with an experienced birder get out and, on, and they walk set routes and they document all the birds that they see or hear over the course of that day. That information um, is collected across the, the continental scale, so across North America, and it gets fed back into a national database. What kind of information can you get from that? Well, you can get information about where species are occurring and really important conservation information like general population trends. And this is an example of some of the information you can get. I pulled this off of the Christmas Bird Count website yesterday. Um, this is information about the peregrine falcon, so that's an animal that we have right here in Minnesota. And this indicates population trends, so relative population trends um, in comparison to previous Christmas bird counts. So uh, the blue and the darker shades of blue indicate areas where the, the sightings have increased over the past several years. The red indicates areas where sightings have decreased over the past several years. 
Um, so for the peregrine falcon, at least, in the context of the per Christmas bird count, this is a pretty optimistic picture. And that's fairly consistent with what we're seeing um, in terms of peregrine falcon conservation outside of the Christmas bird count. What's another example of uh, citizen science? Well, a big one is called Zooniverse, and I can remember about 10 or 12 years ago when Zooniverse was first getting off the ground. This one has a, a special place in my heart because um, I had a good friend at the University of Minnesota. Um, she was coordinating what's called Snapshot Serengeti. Has anybody heard of Snapshot Serengeti before? Okay, so her job, she, she really got that project off the ground, and she actually went after she finished her, her graduate degree and postdoc with Zooniverse, which is based in, in the UK for a couple of years. The idea here is that many of these conservation projects accumulate a huge amount of uh, cameras or, or photos through camera trapping initiatives. The picture in the top right there, that's actually a snapshot Serengeti picture of a secretary bird. It harnesses the power of the people, so you can go online, register to become a user, and they will run you through a training course, and they will teach you how to classify these images. So what type of animal are you seeing? How many of those animals are you seeing? What are the environmental conditions? What is that animal doing? Are there anything, other items in the picture that are worth documenting? Um, this started relatively small and has since scaled up to huge numbers. So there's the snapshot Serengeti picture in the top right. There's also dozens of other projects literally that are uploading their images onto Zooniverse and really leveraging people to help them accomplish their scientific goals and contribute to that research which can ultimately inform conservation efforts. So I love this statistic down on the bottom right here. Um, this is as of yesterday. The Zooniverse works. More than 250 million uh, photos have been classified so far by nearly 2 million registered viewers. That's across the world. That's not just in the United States. That's across the world. So it's the, the ability to, to engage people in science and in conservation on a global scale. So what are some of the opportunities close to home? Well, we do a little bit of citizen science with our conservation department, and thanks to our volunteer corps here at the Minnesota Zoo, we're able to document breeding um, during about mid-June through mid-July for our captive Dakota skipper population. So we maintain what's called an insurance population of Dakota skippers here at the zoo. That's in case things go sideways or continue to deteriorate out in the wild. We've got something to fall back here on at the zoo. Um, so our volunteer uh, network, uh, signs up for time slots and they basically set up shop um, in one of our hoop houses which is located behind bison holding um, and they basically are looking for evidence of Dakota skippers breeding and that helps us um, not only by documenting that but also by figuring out who is breeding with whom so that we can trace the genetics and make sure that, that we're optimizing that genetic diversity in future pairings going forward. <laughs> There are a whole slew of other opportunities for expanding citizen science um, here at the zoo and, and through our conservation department. We have a lot of work going on right now, but I see this as a real opportunity and real potential for growth um, within our conservation programs. There are things like spring migration counts, uh, fall migration counts. There's a, an ongoing bird strike study here at the zoo that's trying to document what types of birds are running into our buildings, when are the peak uh, issues occurring, how are there potential ways to mitigate that threat. Frog calls. There are national frog call efforts during the spring that are going out and they are leveraging the power of uh, local citizens to document what types of frogs they're hearing um, during particular times of year. And like the Christmas bird count, this gives us a way to track the abundance and the uh, occurrences of our local amphibian populations. Historically here on Zoo site, we've had a bluebird citizen science project which has really uh, focused on documenting, maintaining the, the bluebird boxes for nesting, but also documenting how many bluebird pairs are using those boxes, how many eggs are they laying, how many chicks are they fledging, um, are they laying multiple nests within the season, et cetera. So there's the opportunity to revamp this program and help um, make it become more prevalent here on Zoo's site. And then, of course, pollinators. I talked at the beginning about our pollinator project. Um, this is a swallowtail um, larva, but there's a lot of interest in pollinators right now in Minnesota, given uh, some of the, the global insect declines and so forth. So there are opportunities to participate in um, monarch watches, bumblebee watches, both for adults and larvae, larvae of other pollinators like the swallowtail. So this is another area where we could really um, do a lot to contribute to citizen science for our, our local pollinator populations. And that provides a nice segue for 
a plug I wanted to put in for, for an upcoming talk. This is part of what we're, we're dubbing Conservation Night Out. Um, this will be happening in mid-March. Um, this is a, a talk by Dr. Jared Daniels. He is uh, the director of the McGuire Center um, at the University of Florida. He's one of the foremost experts on butterfly conservation, and he has some pretty cool ties back to our conservation staff here at the, at the uh, Minnesota Zoo. So we're really looking forward to hosting him here um, in about a month or so. The title of this talk is called Combating the Insect Apocalypse, One Butterfly at a Time. Okay. So that's, that's pretty dramatic, but I think insects are also facing a pretty dramatic conservation uh, challenge out there as well. So we really look forward to that. Stay tuned for more information, and we hope that uh, you'll be able to join us then as well. So I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the, the various funding organizations that support our conservation programs. Of course, we have the Minnesota Zoo Foundation. We have a whole host of other funders and partners that, that we're proud to be um, collaborating with. And that's all I have. Um, I just wanted to say thank you guys again for coming out tonight. We really appreciate your support um, and, and we are greatly uh, value the support of the Minnesota Zoo Foundation for the Ulysses S. Seal Conservation Grants Program as well. Hey everybody, uh, Tony Grenhauser, Executive Director of the Minnesota Zoo Foundation and I used to think that was the best job <laughs> at the zoo. Clearly mistaken. Um, I'm here just to facilitate questions tonight. I've got a couple remarks, but maybe while I'm just saying a couple things, maybe the speakers could come down, and then um, we'll have a roving mic um, for any questions you might have for any of the speakers. Um, a couple of words of thanks. First, I want to say thank you to Shannon Radigan from our staff at the Minnesota Zoo Foundation. My Shannon really organized this event tonight, so thank you, Shannon. thank all of you. This does not happen without your support, um, your loyal annual support to the Minnesota Zoo, Minnesota Zoo Foundation. That's really how these programs work and we cannot do it without you. I will put in also a shameless plug for a trip um, I am leading to uh, Africa in September. So if you've ever wanted to go uh, to Africa, we'll be visiting South Africa and then also our program in Namibia. Um, led by Jeff Montefering, who's been with the zoo in Namibia for um, several years. And um, um, we still have a couple of spots left. There are no grants available, unfortunately, for this opportunity, but um, it will be exciting and really impactful nonetheless. So um, with that, um, do we have any questions for our presenters? I want to know about walrus cuddling myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Becky. So do you have to like uh, write a proposal as to what you're going to do and in order to get funding? How's that all work? Does one of you want to talk about your experience with that? Sure. Okay. Uh, twice a year, right? Yeah. Yeah, so twice a year we're given the opportunity to uh, fill out an application. Um, obviously, talk about the species that you want to work with, and the conservation department, among others. Um, there's some guidelines that you might know better, but um, how endangered they are, whether we have them at the zoo, that kind of stuff. And then um, I'm trying to think how many you get. I mean, sorry. It, yeah, how many? Sorry, how many you get? Yeah, the, 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 uh, the number of applications really varies. I would say on a, a given cycle, it can be anywhere from about 15 to 25. And we're we're looking for criteria like, do we have a, this animal in our collection here at the zoo, or do we anticipate we'll have this animal in our collection here at the zoo? Um, how endangered, like Christoph mentioned, is that animal in the wild? What's the conservation impact of the work that's being proposed, etc. Um, one of the, the cool things I think about. Sorry, I'll come up here. You're better to answer this. <laughs> uh, one of the cool things I think about the, the, the review process is that we really try to engage the, the entire zoo as well as the Zoo Foundation. This is a program not by the Conservation Department, not for the Conservation Department. This is a program for the entire zoo. So we welcome participation from the entire zoo, both in the application process as well as in the review process. We really value the opinions of, of everybody across the board. Yes, in fact, Heidi, who's handing around our microphone, uh, is a foundation employee who went and studied Arctic foxes in Sweden this past year. And I know nothing about animals. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so it's it's an amazing program. My team will tell you how in awe I was of this program when I first started here at the zoo. I couldn't believe we actually had this available for people, and it is truly impactful. And um, well, you've you've seen evidence of that tonight. Other questions? Well, oh yes, I thought we might, Nancy. I have a coral question. Mm -hmm. I may have missed this, but what's the composition of the 3D man-made tetrapods? Thank you. Yep. Tetrapods. Yeah. They're, so they're made out of uh, clay, concrete and clay, and then they're starting to do um, plastic, like uh, plastic's not the right word. Um, I know they were handmade for a long time, so when I was in Curacao, we made them by hand, but now they're 3D printing them. But I think they're, so yeah, they they're don't disintegrate clay. over time in the water? No, and even if they don't, but the corals will completely encrust over them. Mm -hmm. So if you go back a couple of years later, you won't even see the tetrapod anymore. It's completely covered. Yeah. I have a question. How does this affect you as somebody who works with Minnesota Zoo? How does going into the field or advocating for a field conservation project affect your work day-to-day at the zoo? <laughs> So like for me, I do a penguin talk every day during my penguin feed, and I would talk about sand cow, but this kind of like made me able to like actually, you know, feel like I knew what I was talking about, like I could actually have the experience, and like really feel like I was making an impact on conservation, so that's what I really felt. I've, I've um, I, it was so educational going to Curacao and Bahamas that uh, Josh and I have started having spawn, like trying to do uh, coral spawning here at the zoo. Um, not necessarily what we saw in the wild, but we've gotten our own um, coral embryos, and we're hoping to be able to do our own little research here. So it's pretty cool to be able to bring it back to Minnesota and be able to do coral reef research here at the zoo. For me, I mean, obviously, just the experience in general, but just networking. If I have a question about something going on with our otters, I have a bunch of friends that I made up in Alaska that um, may have had that same issue, or maybe they dealt with something like that. So that just having a making my community a little bit bigger was a huge part of it. With me, I was actually bringing bull snakes to the schools, to the libraries, talking to kids all the time about these animals, which I have never seen out in the wild. And being able to actually see this animal in its natural habitat, see how the adaptations, see how they actually do work out in the wild, really brought a thing to my presentations that I will do to four kids uh, out in the state of Minnesota. So that was probably the biggest part for me. And then I could also talk about the great work that the DNR, that the zoo is doing in conservation. Um, to the kids, so when kids ask us, what is the zoo doing to help uh, animals in Minnesota? I can actually tell them that I actually went out and helped with a program to save endangered animals here in Minnesota. Any other questions? Well, let's have a hand for our presenter. Thank you so much.